Hello. If there's anybody there. Hello. <clears throat> Just waiting until a couple people show up. I don't know if anybody's showing up tonight. It'll still be it'll still be a good Bible study. If it's just me. <laughs> can I can I tattle a little bit here? Josiah, Josiah um, is asking for a uh, an RC car. The, I got no problem with an RC car. RC cars are fun. So the question goes back, we thought you wanted to be a YouTuber and you wanted a, a webcam. His response, I don't want to be a YouTuber. It's important to know that children 10 or even eight years old don't know what they want to do next week, let alone what gender they want to be for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I did. I said that. Okay. All right. Let's see here. I will not be joined by Faith and Kathy tonight. They are working on homework. Tonight we're simply having green tea, because I like green tea. Um, lots of interesting news going around. Um, if you watch CNN, MSNBC, or NBC, or ABC, or CBS, you probably don't know. Um, uh, so I would suggest to you watching Breitbart, or OAN, or even maybe Fox News. I don't really watch Fox News, but... Um, there's a couple of commentators on there that I like. It's important to keep up to date on what's happening in the world. It's interesting. I'm not showing... Is, am I actually live? I don't see it showing up at all. Is anybody out there? Looks like we've got three viewers, but I'm not showing this um, on Facebook. You are, you're able to watch. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. Thank you for... Uh, making it show up. I don't know. All right. Praise the Lord. Um, let's, let's, let's pray first, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great country that you've given us to live in. We lift up, you said to pray first of all for leaders and rulers and those who are in high positions of authority that we might have a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. So we thank you, Father, for President Donald J. Trump and for Vice President Pence. And we thank you, Father, for, their, for the, the White House staff and cabinet. And we thank you, Lord, for those that are in elected positions of authority to govern over this na nation and to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America, not to uphold their, their pocketbooks, but to uphold the Constitution. And so we thank you, Father, that every person who has sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America will find themselves only able to do that in the same situation as Balaam and Balak. And um, sending out to curse but could only bless and so we thank you father that that this nation is highly blessed highly favored highly in the plan and will and purpose of God 
as a joint heir together with Israel, as two nations that are joined together. We lift up Israel, who is the apple of your eye. You have said that those who bless her will be blessed, and those who curse her will be cursed. And so we bless Israel, Father. We bless Israel. We bless Israel in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, that you're causing the, the lost sheep of Israel to be returned and to, to gather together into, into the land itself. And we thank you, Father, for an, an awakening of believers unto your word and a revival of the things of your spirit into the church. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for showing up tonight. Um, uh, uh, I want, I want to, if we could just take a minute to pray. My friend Kim down in, in uh, Santa Maria, her mom is in the hospital. Uh, sure, she's taking her to the ER um, and I want to pray just real quick for her. Father, we just lift up Kim's mom to you right now in Jesus' name. And, and we ask that you would cause favor, that she would be seen instantly, and that whatever is wrong would be resolved, and that she would be healed and whole of whatever situation is taking place in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mm. I had a wonderful dinner. I don't know about you. Good evening. Good evening. We had brandy marinated London broil. It marinated for 24 hours. It was so good. And we uh, had some oven roasted asparagus. So good. I love oven roasted asparagus. You know, it's just really yummy. Um, anyway, so um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, Josiah is still wanting this um, uh, RC control car now instead of being a YouTuber. Um, so now I don't have to buy a webcam, apparently. I've got it in writing. He doesn't want to be a YouTuber now, which relieves me, actually. I, I didn't want him to be a YouTuber anyway. Um, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God does answer prayer and the desires of our hearts. Amen. All right. Well, we are in Hebrews chapter nine, and I've, I've been reading this, and I'm, I'm just, I'm like, as I'm reading it, I'm, I'm seeing stuff come to life, and it's really exciting. I love reading the Word of God and, and having things come to life uh, while you read it. So let's, we've been in Hebrews chapter 9. We've been talking about um, where, you know, I don't know if your Bible says it on the top of the page or something, if it says the new covenant, but really it's, you know, what, what's talking there, it's not about the covenant that Moses had with the children of Israel altogether necessarily. It is specifically talking about the, co the covenant of the Levitical tribe, okay? It, it all falls under the same, it falls under the same heading of covenant, but there's um, the, the covenant that God made with the... Um, you're in Markleyville. That's fantastic. I've never been. All right. Praise the Lord. Um, well, let's just start reading, okay? Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and we are in uh, verse 16. Uh, we'll read verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For, there, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. So in, order, in other words, in order for you to get to be, read the will, right, uh, for your living trust or test, uh, covenant that you've made, uh, that how you want things handled in the event of your death, you have to die. Right? There has to be death. Okay? There has to be the death of the person who makes this will in order for in order for the will to go into effect to affect other people the person who wrote the will who has the authority to give the things must first die simple right uh, grandma has a billion dollars and you're gonna get it all when she dies when do you get it all when she dies right you become the recipient of everything that's in grandma's will, okay? Okay? Um, <clears throat> verse 17, for a testator is in force after, for, I'm sorry, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. 
So I was reading this and I thought about that. I thought about, you know, um, and let, let, we'll just read the next verse, okay? Um, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Um, so there had to be the death of the animal with blood that was a substitute for ultimately for the blood of Jesus that would be shed to enact the ultimate covenant, okay? So in order, for, in order for the covenant that God made with Israel through Moses, there had to be the shedding of blood. Something had to die, okay? And that blood, is a, it, it, it stands in the place as a um, predecessor. It is the um, voucher, if you will, for the blood of Jesus, okay? So I was reading that and I thought, well, let's go back, okay? Abraham, God made a covenant with Abraham. When he was done and he had everything, he had Abraham kill the animals, he had them, he had them spread them out, then he put Abraham in a type of trance and he walked up and down between the, the slaughtered animals where the blood was and he pronounced the covenant okay where there is no shedding of blood there cannot be an effective covenant there has to be by there has to be by by default the death of someone since God could not really good evening now since God can't really die okay in that capacity excuse me God can't really die so something has to die in his place okay um, this is why Jesus comes he is fully man fully God right who fully obeys all the commands of God, and then he dies, and then he gives everything to you and I. Let's go back further, okay? Let's go back to the beginning, okay? Um, just, it reminds me, um, my, my friend um, Teresa, who I went down to visit this weekend, uh, Scott and Teresa, she, she has always said to me, David, Everything always comes down to covenant. It always goes back to covenant. It always goes back to covenant. Everything in the Bible goes back to covenant. So the first covenant that's actually made is between God and Adam, God and man. And he makes a covenant with him. He says, these are the things that you have to do, and these are the things that will be provided for you. All authority is given to you. You, get to, you, you are, the, you are the, the sovereign, if you will, over this planet, you are the king and high priest. You are to do everything that I tell you to, and, you're, and, and you do that and we'll be good, right? Well, um, Adam, Adam commits treason against God. And he gives, he, he, he listens to another voice, right? He listens to the voice of, of the serpent, of Lucifer, and he falls into high treason against God. Now that sin has been committed, there has to be a shedding of blood. How do we know that there was a shedding of blood? Because it says in Genesis that God made clothes for them of animal skin. Okay? These are two people, Adam and Eve. Their best idea for clothes when they sinned were fig leaves. You know, fig leaves are big, but they're not going to last, right? They didn't know to kill an animal. Y your gears are starting to work here. God made a sacrifice or showed them how to make a sacrifice so that they could still work together. <clears throat> okay? It's not until after, it's not until sometime later that God gives permission for the eating of animals. Cain and Abel come to give Cain and Abel come to give um, offerings to God. Cain, Abel brought the right kind of offering, Cain didn't. How, how is God able to say to Cain, you knew what you were supposed to do, why didn't you do it? 
because God's not trying to keep things from us. God's trying to give us a revelation. In other words, God told Adam and Eve what to sacrifice for sin. And then he told, he told Adam, uh, Adam, it's your responsibility as the high priest to tell your family, your children, what they're supposed to give me as offerings. This is, in rabbinic teaching, the beginning of the Melchizedekian priesthood. It is a familial priesthood. The, the priesthood goes from the father to the eldest son, the father to the eldest son, the father to the eldest son. Okay? So all along, we see all these covenants. You're gonna, you see covenant all throughout Scripture. It's all throughout Scripture. It's, in, a, in America, we don't really understand um, covenant because we have contracts, and contracts can be broken, but covenants cannot. Okay? Um, it's, it, it's a Near East thing, covenants. Make, ha, making a covenant, um, Native American people would make covenants with, you know, between tribes. And in every single time, every single instance, there is a cutting and a sharing and a, and a mixing of blood. When Jesus' blood was shed, it became mixed with the earth, therefore becomes mixed with all mankind as, though, as, 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 as one would receive it. Okay? Okay, so verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then he likewise sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered into the holy places, into, into the holy places made with hands, or has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay. Um, so I was, I was uh, down this weekend, uh, uh, stayed in Pismo Beach, uh, dropped Faith off with her friends, and they had a wonderful time, and they all got together and on Saturday, and she stayed with her best friend, Dakota, and she had a wonderful time, um, and she went over to her friend Reese's house, and they got to ride in a golf cart. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with my, my sister, Teresa, and, and Scott, and I was talking to her. I said, I wish that you had come on Wednesday night, because I would have brought you on camera, because we were in Hebrews 9, and I told her we were there again, but she, she just flew back yesterday to Tulsa to visit her, um, her youngest daughter and her family in Tulsa. And um, so I'm sure she's busy. But we were talking and because, you know, it's, um, I, I said, and if anybody's read, read John G. Lake's book, there, there's a, a, a point when he's talking about um, this, this passage. And he says it's almost as if... Um, sin had encroached on the holy place in the heavenlies. Because remember, Moses is told to, he's told to make the tabernacle exactly according, that's me moving a chair with my feet so that I can put my feet up. Um, Moses is told to make the tabernacle on earth and to, to make it exactly as he's seen it in the heavenlies. So here we see that the, the earthly is a copy of the heavenlies. And so I asked Teresa about that. I said, I said it's, it's kind of as if really um, the blood of Jesus needed to be applied to the tabernacle <coughs> in heaven. And she said, why, yes, it did. Um, and so this is her, her explanation from what she's read from rabbinical teachings and, and uh uh, the Talmud, uh, different different rabbis write different things, and you know they have uh, um, oral traditions that have been written down. And this is what this one oral tradition is: the oral tradition in, in the Talmud. Um, and if I've got this wrong, I apologize. I will I will correct it later. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm I'm getting correct what Teresa told me. Um, the original tabernacle or dwelling place of God on the earth was in that Garden of Eden. Okay? Uh, there was an actual God 
God put, he brought his temple. And you can say, well, that sounds weird and hokey. You can say it sounds weird and hokey, but in Revelation, uh, it's coming back. And it's 1,200 miles by 1,200 miles by 1,200 miles is, is the, the expanse of the entire city, okay? All right, so if it's coming here, perhaps it had been here and left, which is why it's so important because um, the tradition is is that, um, hey, Susan, you guys are having a great time. Happy birthday to John for me. Um, the tradition the tradition is is that Jerusalem on the Temple Mount um, is, a, is a stone, is the creation stone, and that's where Adam was created, was on that stone, okay? That's where um, Jacob had his vision. That is where uh, God told... Abraham to go and to sacrifice um, uh, Isaac okay it's up there it's that stone uh, on the Mount of Moriah and it's up there that God tells um, directs for the temple to be built on the temple where we call the Temple Mount um, there up there that is the holy place that is the place where the temple dwelt when it was here in the Garden of Eden. You say, well, we're talking extra biblical stuff here. We might be talking extra biblical stuff here, but I can take you over here to Revelation where it comes back. And it's going to sit in that same spot again. And if it sat there once before, remember, Scripture says, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Okay? So it's not far stretched to imagine this. Okay? It's there where Adam sins against God. And it was his job as high priest of God on the earth to fulfill, to, to, to bring forth the covenant, to bring forth the people that would serve God, to bring forth the people that would worship God as a family. And it was there that God would come in the cool of the day and he would fellowship with Adam. And so it's not far-fetched to imagine this, but I mean, if Jesus had to go to the, to the holy place in the heavens to take his blood, that means that the place where it all originated had to have the blood. And once the blood is there in that place, then that is the reminder in the heavenly place where God sits, that the blood of Jesus sits to this day as a reminder as it was splashed on the walls of the altar. Oh, that's so good. It's a constant reminder as God, our Heavenly Father, is sitting in heaven, that the blood of Jesus is there on that altar. And at the end, the end of the book, come on, the end of the book, the end of the book, it's coming back. It's coming back. It's gonna, it'll be seen for all the earth. It's massive in size now, 1,200 miles square. I found pictures of, of, of the diagram of what that's gonna look like. And I'll, I'll post that later. Um, but it, come on, it, the blood of Jesus isn't just a metaphorical thing that we, we talk about as, you know, oh, the blood, the precious blood. The blood of Jesus had to be listed. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Up here, see, we'll read that Moses had to take the blood. Listen, it says, verse 19, for when Moses had spoken every precept, Jesus spoke every precept here on earth, didn't he? And then when he went to the cross, he said it was finished, right? So he spoke the covenant, right? Um, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with the water and scarlet wool and hyssop. When Jesus was on the cross, they, 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 they used scarlet wool and hyssop with, 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 with vinegar for him to wet his lips. And sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. The book itself. Okay, he's he sprinkled the blood of, of 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 the animals. Now this is the blood of the covenant which which God has commanded you. Jesus now takes his blood, sprinkles it on the book, 
the book of God, the book of life, where every name is written, okay? He sprinkles it, he sprinkles it there in the, in, the, in the holy place where God sits, and therefore on all the people who will believe, okay? This is really good. See, this is, this should take salvation for you as something that's not just whimsical. Like, you know, God made man and then this really horrible thing happened and the God had to come up with a plan and it took him 4,000 years to come up with this plan. And he's like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna send Jesus. No, right there in Genesis chapter three, he says he's going to send one who will destroy everything that the, that the devil had done. Okay? God had a plan. But in order for God's plan to work, he has to use us. Did you know that you right now are part of the plan of God? God is working in you and through you so that you can help others. Your life is a living testimony to the power and the, and the, the, the authority of God. You, sitting in your pajamas, possibly drinking hot tea. God has a plan for you. And it doesn't stop because you mess up. It doesn't stop because you don't know. It didn't, listen, God's plan for David didn't stop because he had an affair with Bathsheba and then sent her husband off to the front lines to have him killed because she got pregnant. God's plan for Abraham didn't stop because he lied and said, no, she's not my wife, she's my sister. Right? God's plan didn't stop. God didn't stop working with Adam and Eve even. Come on, get this in. God didn't even stop working with Adam and Eve. He showed them how things had to be now as opposed to how they were purposefully supposed to be in the beginning. There had to be a change. Okay? God, I don't care how big a mess up you are. God isn't done with you. I don't care how bad you mess things up. God's not done with you. Believe me, trust me, I depend on that. And I know that I can depend on that because Jesus' blood is on the throne in the holy temple in heaven as a reminder that I have been forgiven, that you have been forgiven, that sin is no longer counted to you. And that is really good news. Praise God. I'm so, I'm so thankful for the finished work of the cross of Jesus. I am so thankful that he took his blood and he applied it to the heavenly temple. Once for all. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you so much for the wonderful plan that you have for all of us. We thank you for the plan of salvation. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that's, that, that now cleanses the heavenly altar that now cleanses the heavenly temple, that gives man right standing with, with God, creator of, of heavens and the earth, through all the universe. And yet you've always been mindful of us. We love you, Father. Hallelujah. You know, you gotta stop and thank him sometimes. Amen? Yeah, he is. God is so good. Excuse me for a minute. This is really the best news ever in the whole wide world, right? All right. And it, as it is appointed for verse 27, we'll verse, start in verse 26 again. He then would have to suffer, to, to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. In other words, there's no reincarnation. You die, that's it. You leave your body. You're, you're, not, you're not coming back as somebody else and getting another try. You die once. Jesus died once. There's, there's not a constant dying. There's, aren't you glad? Listen, what a relief that you don't have to die and live it every, every single time different and try to get it right a hundred different lifetimes. 
you can live it right, right now with God, and you can, you can live right before him as a man or a woman of covenant, as a man or a woman covered by the blood of Jesus. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And there is a time he's coming back. He's coming back. He died once, he left, and he said, he said, I'm coming back. Even better, it's a better promise than um, Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator. I'll be back. Because he's actually going to be back. Jesus is going to return. Amen? Soon. Someone asked while I was preaching on Sunday a couple weeks ago, well, when's he coming back? I don't know, but I can tell you it's soon. According to scripture, it's soon. He said, when you see the fig tree blossom, that's Israel, and begin to bring forth fruit. Let me talk to you really quick, too, about something. I want to talk about a peacemaker. President Donald Trump. The UAE and Bahrain and many other nations are making peace agreements with Israel as, as President Trump is working with them. In fact, um, I think it was uh, uh, Dubai, is it Dubai? Uh, as part of the United Arab, United Arab Emirates, I think I watched where they had their first flight from the United Arab Emirates this week into Israel. And today I watched as the delegates from Israel landed in Bahrain. And they are prospering. Israel is prospering. They're prospering, they're prospering as a nation. Um, the nations around them are, are making peace with them. Um, and President Trump has been very instrumental in doing that. Um, naysayers said, you can't do it, it can't happen. And here, here's an interesting thing, um, another interesting thing. With, with mo us moving our embassy to Israel, one thing that happened, and you'll notice is a consistent in all of, in all of the uh, peace treaties that are being made with Israel. Um, when President Trump said that Jerusalem was the uh, capital of Israel, basically what he's saying is that nobody else has a right to claim it as their capital city. I mean, could you imagine if, if Canada said, Washington, D.C. is our capital? And the United Nations started saying, yeah, we kind of think it might be too. Or, or if France, come on, if France said, London is our capital. We have many, many French people in London. We declare that London is our capital. No, it, just because you have people that live there doesn't mean it's your capital. Okay? So when the president declared that Israel was, uh, that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, he's saying that means no other nation has the right to it. Okay, um, let's stop real quick and we're going to pray for Ashley. Um, Jackie just posted this. Heavenly Father, we come right now and we just lift up Ashley to you. And we, Father, we ask that you would give her um, a quieted mind, a peaceful mind. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch her and give peace to her mind and calm her thoughts. You, Spirit of Suicide, we bind you from heaven itself and we loose peace to Ashley right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now you've got these other nations who are making peace agreements with Israel and none of them have anything in it about pa the Palestinians. Um, and they're normalizing their relationships with Israel. That's a huge sign. I mean, um, another indicator, we can, you can look at things, um, biblically speaking. Um, so Israel was in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, okay? It was then that Cyrus, who was prophesied 200 years, I think it was 200 years pre previous, um, God prophesied through Isaiah the prophet 
that Cyrus, the king of Persia, would release the, the Jewish people and bring them back to their land and authorize them to build their temple. This is why the Jewish people and the Temple, the temple Institute have put out the Trump Cyrus coin, is because they were in captivity to the UN for 70 years. Okay? Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem as a, as a vibrant, alive city and Israel as, as, as a nation, and it's, you know, after 2,000 years, a dead language and a dead people became live again, just like Ezekiel 36, you are watching the end times. Okay? Um, there's so much more on all of that. Um, but we're not going to get into all that. Um, I, you know, there, I, there's so, so much. Um, you know, uh, Jesus himself said, you know, uh, brother would turn against brother, right? Uh, family member against family member. Well, you, you see that all around the world now. Um, I just, I saw a video where Vice Pre President Biden, uh, it was, an, it was a, a video um, made for the Islamic people that when he's elected, he would, he would un overturn the, the Muslim flight rule. Um, and then he began quoting Islamic scripture to appeal to the Muslims. Um, strange times we're living in. Anyway, that's distraction. Okay, Hebrews chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come. Now listen, you can look at this and you can say the law, um, uh, and then you can, you can say, well, that's referring to the law, the Ten Commandments. Um, in context, it's really not. In context, the law that's being spoken of here that was a shadow of things to come, you can even hear that, um, can never with these same sacrifices which they offered continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So what, which covenant is it talking about? Which, which law is it talking about? It's talking about the Levitical law, okay? The Levitical law was just a shadow. It could never, it could never bring redemption. In fact, the Jewish people knew that they didn't, that the law and the, and the prophets, uh, the, the law and the, the, the law and the covenant didn't bring redemption because it had to be carried out every year. So see, that's why, you know, the writer here of Hebrews, he talks about, you know, if, if, if the sacrifices of blood and bulls and goats could, could redeem a person, then they wouldn't have needed to continue every year. Salvation has always been by faith. And I love, um, Teresa and Scott and I had an amazing conversation about covenant and salvation and how that um, every person who's ever been saved, it was by faith, it was never by works. You can't hand out enough tracts. You can't make yourself holy enough. You can't make yourself pretty enough. You can't let your hair grow out long enough or cut it short enough or, or wear enough clothes or wear less, less, less amount of clothes or wear too much makeup or no makeup at all. Those things will never make you holy. Those things will never save you. The one and only thing that saves a person is faith in God. Abraham was considered righteous because of his faith in God. You could receive forgiveness. Well, let, let's, let's talk about sin offerings. Uh, Yom Kippur. The one time a year when the, the high priest would go in and, and take, and, and that was atonement for the whole people. Okay, that is a, a type of what Jesus did as atoning for the whole people, like all the people of earth, all who would believe, all who would receive. If you believe on Jesus and receive him, then you can be, you can be a partaker in his Yom Kippur offering of, of a once forever atonement for sin. Okay, and then you're forgiven for sin. Okay, but they had all these other offerings and sacrifices that they had to that they had to make on a continual basis. Okay, um, but the salvation, I, I mean, you think about it. Abraham came before the Levitical law and before before the the commandments that from Mount Sinai with Abraham with uh, Moses, right? Right? 
So how, how was Abraham saved? How was Noah saved? By faith. They believed God, and it was accounted to them as righteousness. Salvation is always by faith. Right? It, so and so believed God, and it was accounted to, to them as righteousness. Okay? It's, you know, it never says, so and so obeyed all the law and commandments, and it was accounted to them as righteousness. F faith is the only way to salvation. And to trust God for your salvation is the only way to be saved. Jesus is the only sure way into covenant with God. Okay? For then they would not have, in, let's see, you see, um, sacrifices which they uh, offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then they would have not, then they would have, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more con consciousness of sins. But in those but in those sacrifices, and the word sacrifices um, isn't, isn't there in the original text, it's italicized. But in those is a reminder of sins every year. In other words, there's a big old constant reminder every time they have the, the, the Feast of Yom Kippur, we're all sinners. And I think, you know, a lot of times Christians, we get that kind of notion, oh, we're just sinners saved by grace, we're sinners saved by grace. No, you were a sinner, you were, past tense, now you're saved by grace. You're not a sinner anymore. You were a sinner who previously could do some righteous works. Now you are a righteous person who probably does some sinful things from time to time, right? You meet, you meet at this point, at this juncture, and then there's no remembrance. There's no more reminder. You don't have to go forward every Sunday and repent. You don't have to go and, and cry and squalor and crawl on the ground. and Oh, Jesus, forgive me. I'm a horrible sinner. No, you don't have to do that. Listen, the best repentance is the one where there's, there's actual repent and turn for the kingdom of heaven is near. And that, what that means is repent and come into the kingdom. Because it's near, you can do that. And so we repent, and then we come into the covenant with, with Jesus and enter into the kingdom of God. And then we begin to operate out of that kingdom. Okay? Okay? For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats that could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Now, this is, uh, this is a quote from... Uh, Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. Um, <laughs> I'm just having a huge deja vu here. Um, uh, but a body you have prepared for me and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the books that is written of me to do your will, O God, previously saying, Sacrifice and offering and burnt sac offerings and the offerings uh, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. Let's skip up over here to verse 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses... Um, to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds I will write them. And he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin, or there's no longer an offering for them. So he has written... And, and we, we talked about this. He has, he has put his law in our heart. How, do, how does he put his law in our heart? Well, the Holy Spirit comes, and he comes and dwells in us, and he puts the seal of God in our heart. The seal of God seals us for redemption. I'm telling you, when God touches you, you get a little bit of him. Okay? All right? Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter, in, enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way, which is consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Now remember, okay, so in the, in the Holy of Holies, there is a, everything else is all these, it's big gold and it's, and it's uh, limestone, limestone and wood and, and gold inlay and, and oil lamps everywhere. 
and all of these beautiful, magnificent vessels, the table of showbread, and etc. Um, then there's this curtain. It's a veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. Okay? The most holy place is separated by a veil. And here it says, um, uh, verse 20, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So that veil represented the flesh of Jesus. So those high priests, when they were going into the most holy place, they were going in through the body of Jesus. So when we stop and we take, we take communion, we're going through the body of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, we're coming to the Father. That's so good. And it says, it says in Matthew that when, when Jesus died and gave, himself, gave up his spirit, it says that that, that veil was ripped It was, I think, about a foot thick of materials. And it was ripped in half from top to bottom. So he says, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now this is important. Hold fast your confession of faith. Hold fast. The blood of Jesus was shed for me. It has been applied to the heavenly holy of holies. And because it's there, God doesn't see me through sin. He doesn't see me through failure. He sees me through the blood. He sees me as though I were holy and righteous enough to come into the holy of place of the holiest place, through the flesh of Jesus, through the body of Christ, into the holiest place. And that's where you have boldness. When you remember that you have come through out of the holy place, into the most holy place, through the veil, which is the body of Jesus Christ, by his blood, then you come boldly. And let us consider one another how to move a sticky note. Let us stir up one another, or to, 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 to stir up for love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Here it is. That's why you get to this point, and the writer of Hebrews says, after you've gone through all of this, after you've done everything else, after you, you hold fast the confession of your faith, Jesus' blood is on the altar in the heavenly heavenlies, heavenly place. It's, on the throne, it's in the throne of God. And God doesn't see me. My Father doesn't see me through my sins and inadequacies. He sees me through the blood. And he says, consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. See, we're supposed to be encouraging each other and, and, and helping each other to do good works. Well, what kind of good works? Well, the kind of good works that believers who, who have that as their testimony would do. And he says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more. Can you exhort and be exhorted at home, apart from the body? You might be encouraged. I was listening to Joel Osteen this morning. That encourages me. But I'm not exhorting anybody. You say, well, you know, my wife and I exhort each other. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you could exhort some other people by fellowshipping together and being in the local body, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of son? Listen, as you see the day approaching. Well, what day is that? That's when he returns. The closer we get to his return, the more important it is for believers to be assembled together. Listen, what we're going through right now in this world, you could say, well, it's Democrat against Republican, or it's, it's conservatives against liberals, or you know whatever it is. But what's happening is there's a dividing line. 
that's being drawn in the sand. Um, one platform is completely um, unscriptural. Well, it's not unscriptural, it's anti-Christ in its, in its format. Um, it, it upholds just unnatural things that God has ordained as good. And then you have another platform that doesn't, okay? And yeah, I can, I can hear you in my head right now saying, Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, okay. But, it, but this is, it's, not, it's not indicative just of this nation. You're seeing it throughout the entire, the entire world. In fact, we'll go back to what we're talking about, about nations that are siding with Israel. Um, okay. <laughs> I see that. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, nations are siding up with and against Israel. Um, President Erdogan of Turkey said that um, Jerusalem, he said this, it was today, it was definitely this week, but today, I believe, he said that Jerusalem doesn't belong to the Jews, it belongs to Turkey. It belongs to the Muslims. Well, you can go back and you can study out history. It does not belong to Turkey. It does not belong to the Muslims. It belongs to the Jewish people. And it has, it has been their home. The Jewish people, even, when they, even, even for 2,000 years, when they, when they weren't there, they were there. You can go back and you can look at the, at the Palestinian flag. Because, listen, it's only called Palestine because the, when, when, when the Romans kicked the Jews out in 70 A.D., they renamed it. They kicked the Jews out, destroyed their temple, kicked them out, and renamed it Palestine. Why? To, to inhibit the Jewish people from ever wanting to come back again. Because they were, they were tired of the Jews revolting against them. Okay? Um, so... As we see the day approaching where, where you see that Israel has been formed into a nation again, um, Ezekiel prophesied it, it's, it's, it's in other places, um, Jesus specifically talked about it. So the day approaching is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is when Jesus returns and judgment begins on the earth. Well, what happens before then? He begins to separate. He begins to separate. He begins dividing wheat from chaff. He begins dividing goats from sheep. We've been watching that, I mean, in small level for a couple of decades, but really just in the last four years since this election, you can see it and you can see how it has affected other nations. Um, as it is with America, so is it with so many other nations um, because, you know, our influence has been so great, world, you know, internationally. And when uh, President Trump declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, it really set in motion a lot of things, prophetically speaking, okay? Um, so we get back to this, well, what does that have to do with this? Because this is the day approaching and you need to be in church. You need to be, you need to be assembling with other people. Even, even, even when I was in Pismo, you know what I did on Sunday? I went to a home fellowship with other believers. I didn't, I didn't just sit on a, you know, I did go out to the beach on Sunday morning. I went out to Grover Beach and I walked in the fog with my coffee and sat in the sand and I had a fantastic time. But then I went back to my room, showered, got dressed, and went with, my, with, with Scott and Teresa to their home fellowship in Santa Maria. And I fellowshiped with other believers in that capacity, okay? It's so important because one, one thing that happens when you fellowship with other believers in the church, in the church context is that you are encouraged by other believers, you're prayed for by other, other believers, you bring a, um, oh, I can see the moon. Um, you have in you an anointing from God. And that anointing that is from God, when you're with other people, Jesus called it, for out of your, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. What happens when a whole bunch of little rivers join together? they form a massive body of water, don't they? Um, the Mississippi River, um, it starts way up in northern Minnesota, um, <clears throat> and it's just a little creek. But as it flows, other little creeks join with it. 
over here, the American River, uh, the Truckee River, um, they have other streams and rivers that flow into them that feed them and then they get bigger and bigger and they become greater, okay? So when you join together with other believers, you bring that portion of you that Jesus spoke about of the Holy Spirit coming out of your belly. It comes out of you. The person next to you has one coming out of them. The person behind you and in front of you has one. And you join together and your river joins with their river and their river and their river. And pretty soon you've got a, a, I mean, a glorious, huge wave of the presence of God. And that encourages you and it lifts you up and it helps you and you need that and listen when you don't show up you are denying other people the presence that you bring you are denying other people the presence of God that's in you have you ever just hugged somebody that was a, another believer and just hugged them and there was just a supernatural connection where when you hugged them or you greeted them, there was, there was more life imparted to you and you, you were encouraged by that. This is why it's so important. I, I don't believe we have mosquitoes. Um, this is why it's so important to gather together. Okay? I know one gal who works six days a week and comes practically every Sunday. God bless her. We love her. Amen. Okay. Um, for if we, let, you know, let's, let's stop there. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go on. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Listen, what did he just finish talking about? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Could it be that it's a sin not to assemble together with other believers? In context, in context, he's talking about being joined together, right? Fellowshipping together, there's exhortation that comes, they're stirring each other up in love and to good works. Well, you know, we'll say, well, to love and good works. What, what, is, what are the good works? When you come together as believers, you're encouraged. You, you talk about opportunities that, you know, may arise and say, hey, maybe we could do this for the community. You know, but the, the, the problem is, is that most people feel that it's the pastor's responsibility to come up with every idea that should be done in the church. No. The pastor oversees the, the leadership of the church. The pastor is the shepherd praying and taking care of the people in the church and meeting with people in the church and counseling people and, 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 and loving on people and fellowshipping with people. But it is not the pastor who has, who has the, you know, sign here, I'm the only one who gets to decide what we're going to do or what kind of ministries we can be involved in. Those are good works, right? Okay, for if we willfully sin after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Okay, now I'm going to tell you what I think that means. What I think that means is if you knowingly go out and just decide you're going to live a sinful life, irregardless of what you know, irregardless of what you, you've read, you're going to go out and you're going to just live a sinful lifestyle. Um, can I tell you that there's a difference between someone who does that and someone who is repentant in their heart? Um, and the, he, Teresa said this this weekend. She said, she said, um, the difference is, she says, there is the person who um, cries but isn't, so, isn't, you know, they're sorry, but they're not repentant. And then there's the person who's repentant and, and doesn't want to keep doing a certain thing, but their mind is not renewed. They're not, they're not able to, to fully move away from a sin that has been hard in their heart or hard in their lives for them to walk away from. Okay? God understands that we have things in our lives that are harder to walk away from than others. It's like fasting. Fasting's really hard for me, okay? Um, I, I start to get shaky and stuff like that, and I need, I need the food. I can fast certain things, and, and I can, you know, stay away from certain foods and things like that. But, um, yeah, I, what I believe there is that it's, you know, it's a person who... Uh, 
was saved and then just walks away from what they knew. See, you know, when I was, when I was, when I was younger, um, I was saved and filled with the Spirit. And I'll close, I'll close out on this. I was, fi- I was saved and filled with the Spirit. And um, I got involved in some stuff. You know, I like weird mysticism stuff and stuff, things like that and um, drugs. And my aunt had this book by Shirley MacLaine called Out on a Limb. And, you know, Shirley and at one point in the, you know, she, she says, she goes out onto the beach and throws her arms in the air and says, I am God. See, I just said that. I don't believe it. I'm just showing you what she did. So I thought, well, I'm going to go do the same thing because I want to see if there's some great, if there's some great, like, supernatural thing that happens to you when you do that. I went out and I just, I did it kind of almost flippantly like I just did right now because I had enough respect from God for God that I knew I wasn't God. And I had enough conviction in my heart not to do something foolhearted like that. And, you know, I lived for a lot of years not walking with God, walking in a direction I shouldn't be walking in. But I was always, I always had fear in my heart that God was going to come, Jesus was going to come while I wasn't living right. And I was going to miss him. And I didn't want that to happen. And one day, here I am in in all this sin and everything I'm doing, and the Lord speaks to me in my heart. I'm, I'm just kind of I'm like, God, I, I know I'm not living right. I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And he says, speak in tongues. I'm like, what? He said, speak in tongues. I spoke in tongues for several minutes. He said, I haven't left you. You are trying to leave me. Come back. Well, I did. And here I still am. All right? And, and that can be for you too. Listen, you know, COVID threw everybody off. Don't let it throw off your relationship with God. Don't let it throw off your relationship with other people. It's so important to make sure that you're living right and doing right and fellowshipping with other believers and walking. Listen, you don't want to walk as, as close to the center, center line as you can. You want to walk as far over to the right as you can get with God. You want to walk as far over with him as you can get so that when you look over there to see where the side of the cliff is, you can't see the side of the cliff. Because I'll tell you, right now, that's the place to be. As close to God as you can get and as far away from the center, from, from, the, from the middle as you can get. Don't be as close to, to living, you know, you've got one foot in the door and one foot outside. That doesn't honor God. You're not pleasing God. You don't want to be one of those five unwise virgins who wasn't ready when he came. You want to be the wise virgin. You want to be the wise bridesmaid who was prepared and ready for his return. I know you do. So just start doing it. Amen? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Father, for the encouragement that's in your word and for the love and the stirring up of the gifts on the inside of us that we can find from reading your word. I bless every person who's watching live or that will watch in the future. I thank you, Father, that you are ministering to hearts. You're causing people to return to you. You're causing people to come to you for the first time in Jesus' name. And if you're out there right now and you're watching and you've, you've never done this before, I want you to pray this with me real quick, okay? Jesus, I receive your blood for my sin. And I choose to walk in salvation and forgiveness with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I believe if you prayed that prayer and you've never prayed that prayer before, or if you've prayed that prayer before and you never really meant it, if you prayed that prayer, you're part of the family of God. Get into a good church. Start fellowshipping with other believers. Start fellowshipping with God. Amen. I love you. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you 10 o'clock for prayer on Friday at the church and at 1030 on Sunday morning. Good night.